Hello and welcome to another episode of the Football History Boys podcast. It's our first episode in a while, but there's a lot of things to discuss, a lot of things to talk about because uh, the Premier League has returned, as have the other leagues in Europe. And also to discuss all this with me, I have, of course, Gav Thomas. It is good to be back. It is good to be back. So I think we'll start off then today by looking at the Premier League. Um, then we'll move on through different uh, different topics that we're thinking about. Um, we've asked you, the listeners, to also send in your best Euros memories because if uh, if it wasn't for coronavirus, we would be uh, all watching the Euros right now, all looking forward to Wales winning the tournament. Uh, but that, that has not to be. But fortunately, the summer is not without football as we have the return of the Premier League. So what did you make of the first two games the other day, Gareth? Well, I mean, I think we, we've had a taste of it, haven't we, with Bundesliga and uh, La Liga. And I've not, I mean, I've not overly enjoyed the Bundesliga, really. I think that it's uh, sometimes lacked intensity and it's been a little bit weird about the sound. However, I was very excited for getting back onto the Premier League. I couldn't wait for it. Um, watched both games. I think they were both decent games, weren't they? Uh, that, that first one, there was sort of not very much goal map action or anything, apart from the incident that we'll come on to in a minute. Uh, second game was yeah. better, though, and their Man City looked brilliant. Man City looked really, really strong. Arsenal, I think they were rusty. I think they definitely rusty would be for all the sides, maybe other than Man City. Man City were the one who came back looking as good as they were before the break. But other than that, I mean, I think uh, it's just good to have football back, and any form of football back is better than nothing. Yeah, uh, I watched. Uh, I've watched a bit of the Bundesliga. Like you say, there's a bit of a. It's weird without the sound, isn't it? It does take away a lot of the intensity of the game. But the, uh, the Premier League um, coming back, I watched it a bit without the crowd noise at first. Um, but I put the crowd noise on in the second game, and I really enjoyed it. Actually, I thought it worked quite well. Um, and yeah, I mean, the second game was quite good. Man City looked like they hadn't been. Hadn't been off at all, really. They yeah. played some beautiful stuff. Uh, De Bruyne was at his imperious best. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing tonight's action. We got uh, today's Friday, so we got Man United, Tottenham this evening. So hopefully that will be a, a competitive game. And on the weekend, of course, we have Merseyside Derby as well. And even with no fans, and even uh, you know after coronavirus, I can't imagine that game not having intensity to it because it's usually quite a full-blooded match the Minnesota Derby so I'm looking forward to that um, so let's get to that first game then the Sheffield United Aston Villa game there was a very contentious moment it's quite mad that after all this time first game back there is already a VAR discussion uh, and also a, a Hawkeye discussion which we haven't really had before because it's usually worked well it always has worked yeah. completely perfectly uh, until you know, in the first half, a cross came in from Sheffield United, taken over his own goal line by the Aston Villa goalkeeper and somehow not seen by Hawkeye. What do you think of it? I think, and, and you know, for anyone who's listened to all of these, I've always been on the side we have, really, of, of VAR and saying that it is a good thing, I think. Yeah. The problem with this incident was that it was Hawkeye failing, not necessarily the referees and there's lots of been there's been lots of criticism of the referees perhaps you know particularly Paul Tierney I don't think um, Oliver had much of a chance you know if his watch hasn't gone off I don't know how he can give a goal you know perhaps the the, yeah. the criticism is for the VAR official Paul Tierney in, in the box not asking for a review really not looking back through that goal and saying oh it's obviously crossed the line um, however you know like we said Hawkeye has worked I think they released a statement saying that it's worked 9,000 times um, yeah. this is the only time it hasn't and so when you look at it like that you sort of perhaps understand where they're coming from those officials because they, they obviously they, I, just, I just presume I can only presume they just don't think it crossed the line because of that you know if yeah. the watch hasn't gone off that's why and I think more than anything they're unlucky that this was the first sort of goal mouth action had say a goal been scored where he smashed into the back of the net you know hits the back of the net and his watch hasn't gone off probably what Michael Oliver's going to go and do and say, oh, my watch hasn't gone off here. That's a bit weird. And they'll get it yeah. sorted. The problem was this was the first goal mouth action and so they had nothing else to go on. You know, football's been away for months. Uh, they Apparently, they tested the watch beforehand and the watch was working. And so, really, why on earth like, would they question it? Um, I, I mean, having a look at the PGMOL, the, the referees' union, obviously, 
as all unions do, they're there to defend their members. Um, and they've come out and said, under IFAB protocol, the IFAB, the people who make football rules, uh, VAR is able to check goal situations. However, due to the fact that the on-match, uh, on match, sorry, on-field match officials did not receive a signal, and the unique nature of this, VAR did not intervene because there wasn't a signal, because there wasn't a goal. They're saying they couldn't really intervene. I think there probably was more they could have done. I think Paul Tierney probably regrets it. I think as soon as anyone on TV sees it, a little bit like thinking back to um, you know, Frank Lampard, say 2010, where, where really sold us on goal line technology in the World Cup where he scores and it's obvious according to replays. I think Tierney could have reviewed it and they could have seen something's wrong. But I understand why they haven't because they, they obviously just think it can't be a goal. I think it's as simple as that. They're going, it can't be a goal. There must be a part of the board that's not crossed the line because that watch goes off every single time. And if it hasn't, then... It's a weird one, isn't it? Yeah, it because is. Because of the way you, way you fell into the goal with the ball like almost rubbed against the post. and It was a, it was a strange one, really. Um, usually, a mild, mild thing is if the ball touches the net, it's usually in, isn't it? So it's, yeah. uh, that's what sort of struck me early on was the fact the net had moved yeah. uh, for, by the ball. So I thought we must be in. But... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a weird situation. Um, I don't think it's going to happen I again. Like... I think they're going to make sure that's never going to happen again, isn't it? It's just unlucky for no, I think... for technology that that's happened. You know, people who are already doubting technology going, oh, there we go, it's failed again. I don't think it has. I mean, God, technology has improved football um, you know, massively. There's been no issues with it, has it? This is the first time, and it is, as Hawke said, 9,000 occasions, first time that it, mm. it's ever come into question. It's just unfortunate. It's the very first game back when everyone's watching and the eyes are on it. It was a nil-nil game, so it, it, mat it, like, it turned the game, didn't it? Yeah, and it's, uh, it's strange. I mean, we, we were on the radio we, yesterday on Talk Radio Europe. Um, we, were, we were discussing it on there, actually, um, <laughs> the, the goal, the, the no goal which is quite cool because we're on there to uh, discuss our book, which came out um, two months ago, uh, well, almost today, actually, two months ago. Um, that's been a, a wild few uh, few months for us, isn't it? I mean, we've appeared on quite a few podcasts. We've been on um, Beat the Press, uh, Shoot the Defence, and a few others. And it's been uh, amazing, really, to uh, to see how the book's got on because it's been, uh, you know, it was a big labour of love to get out all done and submit it off and... Uh, to see it, you know, sold in the shops now is uh, is the next step because obviously not being able to go out to, to the shops or not having shops open during the coronavirus means we haven't actually even been able to see our own book on a bookshelf <laughs> in Waterstones or WH Smith or whatever. So I'm really looking forward to seeing that. Um, feedback's been pretty good. I mean, I've had uh, quite a few of our friends and family have got it or bought it for friends and the word's got around. It's been really nice actually to see people on... Uh, Twitter giving us some nice comments back and it's really really beneficial because during the uh, coronavirus pandemic we've actually managed to get our second book written well ahead uh, of schedule isn't it lot, well ahead of schedule uh, yeah a lot a lot uh, a lot quicker than we, we would have ever imagined it being written um, I think originally it was planned to be finished in November we got it finished by June so really really happy with that um, we'll be able to tell you more about that um, in due course but it's going to be a good one I think uh, <laughs> Um, but yeah, right. Uh, let's have a look then at some of your comments. So we were thinking about the Euros uh, this week um, because there's been on TV and on BBC Sport, they've been showing old Euro games. I think today they're showing uh, Portugal against Germany from 2008. And we asked you guys, what are your best memories of the Euros? So I think we'll have a quick break and then we'll discuss some of those memories. Welcome back to the second part of the Football History Boys podcast. We are thinking Euros, Euro 2020, which is going to happen in 2021. Strangely, they're keeping the name Euro 2020 next year. But be that as it may, we are looking forward to it, even if we have to wait another year, because, of course, our beloved Wales will be there uh, competing again, just like they did in 2016. Left Gareth and I with probably our best memories of being a football fan that whole summer was absolutely incredible seeing Wales to five yards and make the semi-finals but that's our memories and I'm sure you've heard it millions of times in this <laughs> podcast before how much we love the year 2016 but we've asked you guys for what your best memories are of the Euros maybe we'll have a little discussion then 
about them. So let's start with uh, so Ross Kilvington. Ross, he's written a couple of times for us on the blog, and they're always uh, excellent pieces. He says his finest memory of the Euros is from Euro 2000 because of that golden goal in the final. David Trezeguet won the Euros for France, broke the hearts of the Italians with that uh, extra time golden goal. Incredible memory. I think I can remember it quite well as well. One of the first tournaments I remember watching, I think I was about seven. And uh, I remember him really breaking the hearts because I think everyone in my family wanted Italy to win. They were all a bit gutted at the time. Um, what, what do you remember about that tournament, Gareth? This is one that sort of it merges really with other things that were going on at that time. I, I, I sort of just about, I think for me, World Cup 2002 is the first one I remember everything about. Um, and I loved it. And that was where like football sort of internationally sort of grabbed me fully. I think 2000, I remember less about I remember little snippets of games. So that's one that for me, I don't, I don't know, I think maybe my, you know, my, my dad, I said it before, my dad's not massively into football and so the Euros wouldn't necessarily be on as much. So I remember watching the odd game, but you know, actually World Cup 2002 was my first proper international tournament. So it was a, a really big tournament of joint hosts, Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, probably the most famous game of that tournament was Spain against Yugoslavia. Spain went a 4-3 with uh, two goals in, in stoppage time to qualify for the last date. That was a moment chosen as well by one of our followers. Um, Jonathan R on Twitter said that the uh, the Spain v Yugoslavia last minute drama was one of the finest moments in the Euros. He also added a couple of other moments. He had uh, Spain in 2012, possibly being better than they were four years earlier. So that was the Spanish side, which completed that incredible treble of Euros World Cup Euros, they beat Italy in the final four nil. Um, what do you remember about that Spanish side? Yeah, that I, that Spanish side was so good, wasn't it? I mean, I, I watched that one in Tembe in South Wales that final. Um, Italy was superb that tournament. I loved Italy in that tournament. Obviously, funny they put England out, you know, on penalties. That always joyous, you know, as a Welshman to enjoy England going out on penalties. So that was that was great, and then you know, Pirlo in that was superb. And then I loved Balotelli as well at the time, and I wrote about him for TFHB and uh, all the different things like that. And Balotelli had a storming game, didn't he, against Germany in the semi finals? Set up that final against Spain, who are obviously World Cup um, champions and the last year as winners as well, going for their three in a row. And they just decimated them, didn't they? I mean, 4 0 in the final. Um, yeah. Tore them apart. You know, Italy were a good side, they weren't, they weren't a slouch. By any means, and yet they they really did tear them apart. So I think that Spain side they really sort of cemented their legacy, didn't they, with three tournaments in a row? Yeah, the Perlo at the peak of his powers really wasn't he in twenty twelve, and uh, like you say, Balotelli when he had that brace and he took a shit off with the uh, the flex celebration against Germany. Yes, yeah, really yeah. Summed him up, didn't it? Really? Yeah. I mean, that was a uh, they were really good that tournament because they they played Spain the group. Well, they drew one all. Yeah, it was a surprise actually to see how much of a batter they took in the final but it just shows how good Spain works when they needed to they just turned it on um, right let's have another moment then so this is a very common one uh, Alex Horsburgh has said 1988 that Van Basten goal the volley in the final against the USSR Marco Van Basten winning the game with one of the greatest goals of all time so a few people have said that um so what do you think about that one, Gareth? Oh, it's such a lovely goal, isn't it? It's so nice. And I mean, it's one of them ones. They were in a beautiful kit with it. They're a lovely kit, that that Euros. Um, yeah. Netherlands. And the board's over the top. Lovely, lovely, delightful ball over the top. And I'm not sure who who, who played it into him. I can't remember who played the ball into it. But um, lovely ball over the top. And then he hits it so sweetly, isn't it? And that's the sort of goal you want worthy of winning you uh, an international tournament, isn't it? So good. It's become... Um synonymous isn't it that type of volley now with Van Basten it's, it's a Van Basten volley so um, Kasami doing one f- uh, for Fulham a few yes. years ago oh, that was nice. yeah yeah um, just over the shoulder yeah, Murphy, yeah. And that sort of looping looping volley if yeah. a tight angle it's uh it's so nice to see that was also chosen by uh, Mike Pieri uh, who also had a few other moments you mentioned the 84 French midfield um, with, uh, of course, Patini, who scored a famous goal in the semi-finals against Portugal. He also said when Theo lifted the trophy in 2004, so it's uh, Theo Zagarakis, um, Greek 
uh, captain. And that's obviously one of the greatest shocks. Uh, probably is the be- the biggest shock in uh, international football history. I know Denmark with the Euros in 92 is a massive one. But I think Greece would in it. Because I don't think Greece had ever won a, a game at a major tournament or some, something like that. So they were massive underdogs. And of course, they played that quite negative style of football where they just defend deep and score score a goal through, you know, Karis Deas or someone. And then just Delas up, play unbelievable at the back in that. Uh, you know, holding off some of Europe's greatest sides. They they got past Portugal in the opening game. They got past uh, Spain as well. I think they uh, made a draw with them. Uh, they beat France in the quarterfinals. They beat that amazing Czech Republic side in the semifinals, and then beat Portugal again in Portugal to win the Euros. I mean, so what a side! And so what a good. Side. I mean, people said when we did the uh, greatest, uh, the greatest ever tournament with the uh, on Twitter. A couple of months ago, a couple of weeks ago, it feels like ages ago, and I was in lockdown. But um, the the tournament to find the greatest ever international side, a lot of people were like you can't have Greece in there. They just defended to win it. But I mean, I, I don't. That's that's not a, not an issue for me. It doesn't matter if they defended to win it. They never should have won that tournament. If they played open, expansive football, they never would have won that tournament. They did what they needed to do to make sure they could win it. And I think, um, you know, it is a massive, massive achievement. Is I love an underdog story. Perhaps that's just the Welshman. Uh, in me and I think for me that is one of my favourite memories 2004 uh, just before moving up to secondary school for me uh, loved it what a tournament that was yeah it was uh, I remember I watched a lot of that tournament I yeah I really do remember it and being surprised but remember I remember really supporting the Greek uh, Greeks yeah. by the end as well remember the side of you know, Katsouranis and Karagounis and uh, Yanakopoulos and things and it was a good it was a really decent team and the fact that they won it was was testament to that you know, like you say that quite pragmatic approach because if like you say if they played open expansive football they wouldn't have won it because that just didn't suit them so they played yeah. how they how they knew how to play and they, they won it I mean teams have won major tournaments since and before having a lot of an easier run as well to a, to a final oh, definitely. Them. yeah definitely yeah definitely Czech Republic side was incredible that year. We, I think we all thought they were going to win it. You know, Barros, Koller, Poporski, Nedved, um, and so on. Uh, and the fact that they beat them through that silver goal, of course, in the um, in the semi-finals uh, was amazing. That, uh, that silver goal, you can read about that in our new book. I won't tell you why, but you can. <laughs> um, right. D- uh, Mike Pieri has also said, being in the Welsh end against Belgium in 2016, he said as a video on Twitter at Actually, this uh, really, really amazing atmosphere. He said um, in the Welsh end, of course, that famous game we've talked about billions of times. Robson Carnu scoring the, the greatest goal of all time, and uh, Sam Vogue scoring the greatest header of all time um, to, to knock out Belgium. <laughs> A few other people have sent us gifts or images of Robson Carnu's Cruyff turn as well. Do you uh, think LMC on Twitter? Do you think that is a genuinely big moment? Obviously, we're Welsh, and so we're going to say this is huge. And, you know, for me, I, I've said before, he's a better Cruyff turn than actual Cruyff himself or whatever. But do you think for other nations, this is still a major moment when they reflect on sort of Euros of the past? I would be surprised if, you know, English fans don't put this ahead of Gascoigne's goal against Scotland. So, <laughs> it's, uh, I, know, I don't know, really. I, I guess they wouldn't. I think if... In Welsh football, obviously, it will be revered as the the biggest moment, you know, probably in Welsh football history now. But yeah, I, I do you reckon they know about it in Italy? I Spain? think I think probably across Europe that Belgium were favoured. You know, it's that internal thing of them being the dark horses. This was the tournament they were supposed to actually step forward and win that tournament, wasn't it? And and really, when you look at uh, how it went down with yeah. Iceland they were having the a run as well, yeah, I was, yeah, there's no way, there's no way Wales should have won that game. You know, we would have been shocked. Think about it if it was, say, Iceland then, or we were watching Iceland, Belgium, and that happened, we would be stunned. So I imagine it is, it is something worth talking about. It's disappointing, though, actually. Match of the Day have been doing um, a countdown of their top 10 moments, or top 10 players, or top 10 sending offs, or whatever. Uh, and they, they talked about this one, and I think Ian Wright put this in like ninth out of 10, which is ridiculous. He'd put, he'd put all the England moments ahead of it. But this is, I think this is huge, because this is little Wales who have not been to a tournament since. 1958, and yet we come and we do this. We get to the semi-finals, and you know I'll forever curse the fact that we missed Ben Davis and uh, Aaron Ramsey for that semi-final against Portugal as well. I mean, I, I wrote about it in the new book, uh, Euro 2016. It's only one really. I think if 
in England, it's seen as like, well, it's a terrible tournament. They allowed all these lower teams in and, uh, you know, it was really boring and dull. But most people then, I think, uh, wider Europe, write about it quite favourably, being like, this is a great tournament. Yeah. The the underdog sides, the, you know, the Wales, the Iceland, the Northern Ireland, they actually all did really well and they actually performed above themselves. I mean, Hungary won their group, they uh, head of Portugal and so on. So I think it gets a bit of unfair criticism, Euro 2016, from what I've been reading, because, you know, I think it's a f- f- fantastic tournament and the, you never knew how a game would go. You would never yeah. think Iceland would beat England. You wouldn't think Wales would beat Belgium. You wouldn't think Northern Ireland would get to the last 16. It was uh, an amazing tournament. And that Northern Ireland uh, uh, run to the last 16 is also chosen by someone on uh, our Twitter, um, Rodney McCain. He said, Gareth McCauley, the kings of Lyon, hmm, nice, um, when they beat Ukraine 2-0 to qualify is is his biggest or best moment of uh of the Euros, and that was that was massive, to be honest. I mean, Northern Ireland of you know Wales has always been pretty rubbish, but since we since we've been alive, Northern Ireland have always been worse. So the fact <laughs> that they did quite well too is a uh, you know testament to that tournament and the fact you could net you couldn't predict things and you never knew who was gonna who's gonna win a game. And I think it's it should be regarded as one of the best. Yeah. Yeah, I, I I think so too, and I think um, that's why interestingly, I, I, you know, Euro twenty twenty when it happens and what it was going to be this summer, I think it would have been quite an interesting one again because there's some sides who qualified there who perhaps um, you know were shocks that they got to the tournament. Uh, obviously, it was supposed to be all across Europe, wasn't it, to celebrate? Was it sixty years since the first ever sort of European yeah. tournament? Um, so it's supposed to be hosted across Europe. I don't know how that would have worked out, but I think I think we would have seen a fine tournament. And I hope next year it's not sort of ruined by perhaps some sort of knackered players because they've had to play longer and you know go into August this this year and then obviously they're back straight away in September with very little break or whatever I think I hope this doesn't sort of spoil the Euros and you'll get a lot of injuries towards the end of next season or something to as, as players start to prepare for that tournament I think the year 2016 as well people say added more teams made it a, a poor tournament but they think you know, Holland didn't even qualify for that tournament. Yeah. You know, so some of the, the biggest sides didn't even make it to the final tournament. So it does show that European football is, is pretty competitive, really. And if some of the, the biggest teams in Europe aren't making it, yeah. even though it's been extended to 24, surely it hasn't lowered in quality. Um, right, next moment then. We've got a couple more about Euro 2000. Um, Mike Pieri did say his uh, stag do was... Uh, <laughs> held at year 2000 as well which looks like a, a, a cracking cool, picture there um, my stag do next year so we'll never know um, right let's have a look at another one we have Spain beating Germany in 2008 final passed them off the park now this is Luis Aragones's mm. Spain not Vincente Del Bosque Spain I think some people often put that Spanish side from that era as Vincente Del Bosque side but that's this first win was Luis Aragones and it was his it was his mastermind, really, wasn't it? That 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 one in that tournament, the introduction of Tiki Taka. Uh, we've talked about this before. What do you think about that Spanish side? I, the wise man of Hortaliza, wasn't it? That's what he was called, Luis Aragones. Uh, passed away a few years ago now. Uh, uh, that side really it just did blow everyone away, didn't they? They passed. They did pass him off the park, as um, as the person who submitted that one said. I think. Really, when when you look at that again, Spain for me, growing up, were never you know a big side. They weren't someone you considered a, a decent side at all. Really, I remember sort of thinking, oh, you know, just average Spain, and they they did blow it away that tournament. Obviously, building on it, then under Del Bosque in two thousand and ten World Cup, and then two thousand twelve, as we said earlier, winning the the back to back tournaments is is superb. But it was just a whole new way of playing, wasn't it? A whole new way of playing with, with really likeable players. I liked so many of that Spanish team and I think that some of them now are questionable and people don't like the way they roll about and various things like that. But it, I don't think it was really a thing so much back then. I think it developed over time, didn't it? But back then they were quite a likeable yeah. Spanish side. I think that developed from the uh, the Barcelona, didn't it? The, um, the Guardiola side going down quite easy. But then, that, but then they developed that from the Mourinho and the sort of just the Real Madrid Atlasco and it, you know, we all just, we just spill over, didn't it? And yeah. the theatrics, but the 2008 side, of course, had Marcos Senna in midfield, who um, it's often forgotten man, I think, of uh, that Spanish football evolution. 
You always think about Xavi, Iniesta, Busquets, David Silva, Fabregas, Xavi Alonso. But in year 2008, it was Marco Senna who would start the games. Um, yeah. A really good player, defensive midfield. And like I say, the, the way that they passed the ball was, was incredible. And if you watch footage or you know, re- repeats of the 2008 tournament now, the commentators are just purring over every Spanish move. And they're saying, this is just the best football I've ever seen. This is amazing. I think eventually it got found out for Tiki Taka and it got people who managed to work it out. And then it became quite boring and mundane as you see people just passing it from side to side. But back in 2008, it was, there was a definite aim and it would be let's yeah. pass this and try and go as quick as we can to the goal um, rather than just passing for the sake of passing. So I think that's 2008 side maybe had the most, um, the most pure Tiki-taka. And it wasn't yeah, dominated, Spanish interestingly, Spanish. by... It wasn't so much Real Madrid-Barcelona. If you look at Spanish squads even now, they're very much just made up of players who are at Barcelona or Real Madrid, aren't they? And, and that's amazing in itself, of that side that they hate each other on the pitch. Um, lots of them didn't get on. You know, you look at Pique Ramos, didn't get on with each other, yet they played together on the national stage and, and win the World Cup or whatever. But that that Spanish side, I mean, you look at this um, Sevilla representatives, Valencia, Villarreal, Real Betis, Mallorca, uh, Getafe... Zaragoza, there's, there's representatives from across La Liga, really. And, of course, there's a couple. There's Pep Marini from Liverpool and um, Arbeloa at Liverpool, Javi Alonso at Liverpool, Torres at Liverpool. So there's uh, influences on, uh, of English football in there, too. But I think that side really was someone who just burst onto the scene and, and then followed that up two years later at the World Cup. And suddenly this this Spanish side are revered as, you know, sort of the team of the the 2010s and or tw- the 2000 and the 2010s, aren't they? Yeah, incredible side and uh, one I think that me and you will probably always uh, hold close to our hearts because, you know, high high school days dominated by that Spanish side. Yeah. Uh, Right, next up, 1984, this is from More Than a Game 66. He says, uh, 1984, uh, doesn't mean the book, it means the Euro tournament. (laughs) Uh, It says, classic games. There was no England, no Italy, but there was Platini. There was a Simonson leg break. Mm -hmm. Uh, The Danish dynamite side, uh, Arcanada's final era, France v Portugal semi, and he, all this despite having near no TV coverage, coverage as England played a South American tour. So that uh, sh- shows it doesn't have the, the sort of the 80s and so on. In that English, you know, were the best, and uh, even the Euros are not going to show much because mm-hmm. we'd rather show England on tour. Um, but that's obviously a, a very famous tournament, revered. It's the second one of an eight team, two group stage tournament. We've for that, uh, so from 1960 to 1980, it was a tournament uh, of which only 14 that actually played in the final one, two semi-finals, a final and a third place playoff. Um, we've written about that in our new book as well. Um, the first Euros, 1960, the Soviet Union winning amidst massive political backlash. Um, although it was played in France, so they were they qualified. The other three teams from Eastern Europe. And Spain had a chance to get through to the semi-finals and uh, um, the final tournament, but they denied. They they didn't want to go because they didn't want to play against their communist rivals, the USSR. So shows how politics and football are never too far away. Even in 1960, you know, the height of the Cold War, the Spanish didn't want to go. Ironically, 1964, Spain actually beat the USSR in the final. So it shows a. How things can turn around quite quickly, and how you know how big a sport, a bigger role sport can play in a, a nation's achievements. Um, speaking of politics in football, uh, we're going to just move on now because we've been in quite a big week actually for politics in football with the Black Lives Matter movement. The first game back in the Premier League, seeing Aston Villa and um, Sheffield United taking a knee after Michael Oliver blew the whistle, a, a fantastic moment for football football history, showing the solidarity with the movement that uh, started in America. Uh, and then, of course, it was repeated then in the uh, Arsenal Man City game as well. I'm sure it will be repeated this weekend. Uh, as well as that, we have Marcus Rashford uh, campaigning for uh, free school meals for children over the summer holidays, showing the power that footballers can have in ch- changing the opinions of people right at the top of the society. So what do you think about this thing, Gareth? Um, obviously, we're both teachers. Um, you know, we've, we've seen children and we've seen the social background, socioeconomic economic backgrounds they've come from. 
we know that uh, some of them have to go through a lot of really, really hard stuff in life. And Marcus Rashford was very honest in saying that he himself had been through this and he had had free school meals given as a kid. So what do you make of uh, his his role recently? I think it's an incredible stand, isn't it, that he's taken. And um, it's something that's united fans across the country, really. I mean, there's there's some... Uh, questionable characters out there saying oh, I don't want to feed other people's children so no not really interested in that opinion to be honest if you're going to have an opinion like that but I think um, as a whole you know footballers have been lambasted at times certainly over lockdown saying they get all this money why aren't they giving more away why aren't they doing this why aren't they doing that football's an easy target and um, on another podcast we did didn't we? we made reference to that it was it beat the press um, we we made reference to the fact that actually, just like in the war where football was targeted, it's quite an easy target at times, isn't it? Because they earn good money, they're popular characters, so let's hammer footballers. Whereas here, this is Rashford standing up and saying, I was on free school meals. I know what it's like to uh, be hungry. I know what it's like not to have um, everything you need for, for daily life and how that can disadvantage you. And he's someone who's found immense fame and immense wealth now and he's using that. I mean, I know he's donated millions upon millions of pounds as he to charities previously. And this was him standing up and saying yeah. the government needs to prov- provide food for um, some of the poorest children over the summer holidays. There is, there's so much data that goes into it, you know, sort of teaching the well-being side of it, of looking at them and saying actually those kids are fed during school time because they get free school meals and then in the six weeks on holidays they, they're getting you know, almost mal, malnourished from not being uh, given food and so all he's saying is stand up and you know let's give some money to these families and uh, provide free school meals for them which is, is great that he's decided to do that and I, I like that how it's united all football fans that you see people saying what a great guy you know even Man City tweeted saying Manchester United um, as a city and things like that so it's nice to see although I do get wound up by people who comment the um, love that Rashford from a Liverpool fan or love that Rashford from a City fan I don't, I don't care who you support yeah. I don't, you just say well done Rashford yeah, yeah. doesn't give you extra credit just because you're a Man City fan saying well done to Rashford like that's the <laughs> partisanship of football yeah. but, um, but incredible isn't it and, and you know, and he, he caused the government to do a U-turn even though he got called Daniel Rashford wasn't it by uh, Matt Hancock on, oh, on yes. TV <laughs> yeah oh. There we go. Yeah, because he was the one who was calling out footballers, wasn't he, in the first place? Yeah, um, yeah I mean, I, I was conversation on Twitter yesterday actually with uh, Nathan Amin, on, uh, who's, a, who's an author. Uh, Henry the Seventh, I think, is his main thing. But he was um, saying about uh, how he's getting a bit annoyed at like, the, the partisanship of uh, football fans now and the sort of blind loyalty people sometimes have towards their club, even if even if the person talking is, is talking nonsense and some people will defend them to the hills because they yeah. happen to support the same side. But, yeah. um, you know, there we go. I mean, Mark Rashford, amazing. Yeah. What a job he's done. Top um, line. Fantastic. Right, we'll take a break and we will come back in just a moment. Hey, welcome back to the podcast. Um, we're going to do a bit, a bit different this time. We're going to do guest of the year, but I'm going to do it for Gareth this time. Now, usually Gareth gives me seven clues to famous things that have happened in history, the seventh of which is a famous football moment, and then I have to guess which year it happened. So we're going to do it differently this time. I'm going to give them to Gareth. I've got out my big, uh, big history book, a visual history of the modern <laughs> world. Uh, okay, you ready to go? Shoot. Shoot. Okay, uh, first clue. The United Press International News Agency is formed. Ooh. And that could have been well early on. 1930. Okay, 1930. Okay. Uh, number two. The first ever Grammy Awards. The Oscars started about, was it 1927 when the Oscars? Grammys of music. Maybe 30 still. Or maybe, maybe just post war. Maybe let's go 48. A nice little post war thing to get people happy again. <laughs> You're lovely. Okay, number three. Uh, Mao launches the Great Leap Forward modernization program in China. Ah, Mao. Now that narrows it slightly. Hmm. Mao then. 50s Mao, isn't it? Mao Zedong. I can't, I don't, I can't think of his exact 
rule, but I think it's around. I think it's his fifties and sixties, isn't? It? Uh, he's into seven. He's a while. He's a while. Um, let's go with fifty-nine. Okay. Uh, next one. U.S. scientists begin measuring the ozone layer. Hmm. Good question. I don't yeah, know, good that. Don't know why I'd know when that is. Let's say the sixties. They start in the sixties, maybe nineteen sixty. A year later. Okay. Um, the debut of Blue Peter on the BBC. Ah, this is interesting. They had their anniversary, didn't they? Not so long ago. They were, how old were they? 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2010, 2010. I think, I think they're about, I think they're 60. I think they were 60 in 2017, 2018. Let's go 2018, 60 off that, 58. Okay. Number six, the hula hoop craze sweeps the USA. <laughs> that could have been fifty-eight. I'm gonna stick with Blue Peter. I'm gonna say fifty-eight. But yeah, it could be. It could be around then. It's sort of a fifties. Uh, probably earlier than that, though. Isn't it? I don't know. Let's go fifty-eight. Fifty-eight still. Okay. Final clue: a star is born. Edson Arantes de Nascimento, also known as Pele makes his World Cup debut. Of course, yeah. I, I didn't even see you were going that way. Yeah, Pele knocks Wales out of the uh, the old World Cup. Yeah, 1958. Today, day, actually. Was it? Yeah. So, 58, you were right on the fifth guess, mate. I mean, you're pretty close. You said 59 earlier on as well. So, yeah, that was, fair, just, that, that was just the real guess. Better than me at that. So, well done. <laughs> <laughs> it's Blue Peter. I, I, don't, I used to like I used to love that. Good show. Good show. Yeah. Connie Hutt. The guy. Brilliant. Right. Well done, mate. Oh, thank you. What's next? Um, well, I mean, just to promote, um, obviously, uh, we'll get this out as soon as possible, but Father's Day is on the way. If you do own something such as Amazon Prime, other book shops available, but certainly if you own Amazon Prime, you are able to order this today. Or even not, if you order it on Saturday morning, it could be there by Sunday, by Father's Day. Order our book. Why not have a look at our book, Football's 50 Most Important Moments. For only £11, I think it dropped again to £11.83 at the moment on Amazon. Uh, lots of other places selling it too. Give it a go. Your father will love it. There's lots of good reviews on there. So why not check it out? Football's 50 most important moments. How else can you get in contact well, with you? Can... Sorry. I mean, you could buy it from as a Mother's Day gift, but a very late one as well if you want. I mean, I'm sure the mums would love it three months late. That's true. Or an early, or early Christmas present. Perfect Christmas present. Yeah. Get going. Oh, an end of that. lockdown present you know you, if you're seeing family members you haven't seen for months and you're thinking I should take them something you know maybe a bunch of flowers for uh, one of them and uh, you know the book for the other why not yeah you know you could have the book instead of flowers you know there we go longer lasting uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay you can also get in touch with us on Twitter at TFHBS. You can uh, email us, the football history boys at hotmail.com. You can go on to our website, www.thefootballhistoryboys.com. We've had loads of guest blogs recently. It's been fantastic. They've helped us keep the blog running when we've been pretty busy with all the lockdown teaching. So thank you very much to everyone who's uh, given us a guest blog. We've written a couple ourselves as well. Yeah. We've got one about shirt numbers. We've got one about Peru versus Austria at the 1930s. Six Olympics. We got one documenting the history of extra time. So if you want to learn about any of those things, head over to the website. Definitely check out. I mean, just to say a big thank you to people like Alex Horsbury who kept us going over lockdown. Um, Scottish radio presenter who got involved said, uh, "I want to write some Scottish pieces for you." We didn't have a vast amount on there about Scottish history, and so it's been great to have so much uh, sent in from Alex on all different aspects. He's very unpartisan in that that way. Uh, he's written about Cowden Beath, he's written about Dundee, he's written about Celtic, he's written about the Scottish national team. So if you are a Scottish listener today, go and check out on the website, thefootballhistoryboys.com, definitely. But before we go, we're just going to do one last thing. We're going to pull out our predictions that we made right back at the start of the season. I'm pretty sure, Ben, neither of us predicted that there would be a massive break because of coronavirus. I think we were, we were wrong about it. About it. <laughs> 
Um, so we're going to pull out our own predictions um, and we'll see how we did. We, we, we predicted the top four, the bottom three, uh, Golden Boot, Champions League, which of course is still going on. You know, it all should be wrapped up by now. Uh, but we'll just see how we do as we head into those last couple of weeks of the season, this, this intense run of football. Uh, so a final break and then we'll come back and review our predictions. Okay, just before we head, uh, back in episode three, months and months ago, in a different world, it feels like, um, in the episode, Valerie Shmirnov, Premier League's all-time top goal scorer. Listen to that episode to find out who Valerie Shmirnov is. Uh, we predicted some things for the season ahead. We predicted top six. We predicted bottom three, golden boot in the Premier League, player of the season in the Premier League. Not that's poor, that we've done poor there. And um, also Champions League winner. So we both said the same for top one. We both said Man City were going to win the league again. We both thought Guardiola would make it another season, another season of dominance. Ben, as a Liverpool fan, you must be delighted that in the case. Yeah, I mean, it's still mathematically possible, but, you know, I am delighted. In second place, we both thought Liverpool. We thought they'd fall short again. But as it stands, it looks like you are about to end your long, long drought. Even if it's got an asterisk, as people keep saying, uh, it will still be a fantastic uh, oh, victory. Asterisk, uh, I mean, this the whole season will be asterisks, won't it, in that way. But, you know, if they play out with 38 games, there's no one, anything to complain about, really, is there? So, yeah, it would be a fantastic achievement, obviously. We're in third. Both of us said Chelsea. Thoughts? Mm, okay, possible. Yeah, I think they, they're going to have a great run. I mean, they're, they're five points off Leicester at the moment. I think, I, I don't know why I was trying to, uh, Tom Passmore and Lewis Williams were this my mate, so we were just talking about why, what we think. And, you know, I just, for me, I feel like young players are going to come back into this. I don't know if there's any sense in that. But Guardiola seemed to say something similar um, about how his young players have adapted better. And, you know, Chelsea have got a very young squad. Do you think there's anything in that? Do you think the young players will adapt, getting back to this quicker, you know, will just be up for it more, will be fitter immediately? Um... More able to play those games in shorter bursts and things like that. No, I wouldn't agree with that myself. I think the more experienced players will come through, and I think even though they're coming back after the long break, it's still like the the end of the season. I think it's more it's the experienced players who will know how to finish a season off. I think still, I think that will that will beat youthful exuberance. Um, but you know, I, I still think Chelsea got a really good side, and I think they'll. Um, I think they'll they get top four. They could get top three. We said before though that they've got a good team to go on big runs, and then they've sort of had big big periods of being quite average, haven't they? So yeah. um, it'll be interesting. Yeah, I think I think they may they may well sneak Leicester. Because Leicester just looking at fantasy football, which is still going on by the way. Get involved in that, but um, they, I think Leicester have got a horrendous run of fixtures, and Chelsea have got a really nice run of fixtures. So they yeah. may well pip them. Uh, looking at then the bottom, the, the last one in fourth place, we both said Tottenham. Uh, you said Tottenham because of Ndombele. Um, and I mean, uh-huh. Tottenham are in eighth. They, they may well sneak further up the pitch because they've, uh, sorry, further up the table because <laughs> they've, they've got um, Harry Kane and that back now for this run in. But no, they, we were wrong there. They didn't get top four. We didn't say Leicester. Who would have thought Leicester, third place at the moment? They may well hold on to that third place, but in, uh, an incredible season yeah. Leicester have had, haven't they? Yeah, great season, good, good manager. Uh, in fifth, this is the only one I'm on to get right at the moment. I said Man United fifth. As it stands, they are in fifth. However, they probably have the nicest fixtures of any of the clubs left. I think they are going to get into that top four. I, they, they may well be there anyway. They may well get a Champions League place with the whole Man City ban, but I think they will probably sneak a top four um, or, or may well sneak top four. Say. You said Arsenal. Oh. <laughs> You mean I didn't say Sheffield United? I can't believe it. Darren Knight. <laughs> um, Arsenal. Uh, you said Dano Ceballos and Unai Emre will come together and make it, <laughs> make it into fifth. <laughs> <laughs> um, oh, never listen to me again. <laughs> uh, I had Arsenal in sixth, though in fairness not much better, and you had United in sixth. So uh, not a million miles apart that. Our bottom three we were very, very wrong on this. Apologies to fans of all these clubs. So in bottom bottom of the table you said Brighton and Brighton are currently uh, looking pretty safe well they're, they're not a million miles off the, the run yet but they are in 15th um, so they should be okay 
Uh, you said bottom. I said Sheffield United bottom of the table. <laughs> they are yeah. in sixth place and they could well qualify for the Champions League. Depends on Man City's ban and if they yeah. can better Man United, perhaps. Uh, then I said in 19th, I said Newcastle for the reasons of uh, oh. Bruce sacks at Christmas and Pardew takes them down. <laughs> <laughs> and you said Sheffield United in 19th. Um, and then you said Burnley in the final relegation spot. And I said Crystal Palace. But I did say only if Zahar goes and he didn't go. And so that's why, although he's not had a fantastic season, but they're in 11th. So we were wrong on that as well. Uh, Burnley uh, 10th at the moment too. So uh, apologies to them. We underestimated them. Looking at uh, Golden Boot, I said Harry Kane. You also said Harry Kane. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I wonder if you said he'd get loads of penalties. Yeah, I thought I thought he would. I thought he'd, uh, you know, have a great season. He, he's, he spurs his top goal scorer. He's got 11 goals. Was injured for a period of time, though, isn't he? He's that, sadly, he's looking like he's starting to become a bit of a broken man, isn't he, injury-wise? We'll see what he's like now in the in the running for this uh, period of time. I mean, you'll have to be rested, I imagine. I think he's able to play every game in the amount of time they want to play. Um, play of the season, then. I said, oh, this is poor for me. I said, Sterling, play of the season. He's had another decent season, isn't he? Um, oh, Bernardo Silva, thinking that Man City would dominate. And I, I said on that pod that um, he would take the place of David Silva. But obviously, not quite happened. I wasn't, it wasn't quite right there. You said uh, Firmino for that. He's been okay. Yeah, I mean, he's, he's had not a, been the best. But... Bit of a goalless run, isn't he? But he's 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 not he's not just about goals, is he? He's about everything else he brings to Liverpool, isn't he? Um, yeah. And finally, the Champions League. You said Liverpool would win another one, um, or if you if you were pushed for another one, you said Juventus or Barcelona. And I said Juventus, hoping that Ramsey would win one. I mean, sadly, he doesn't look like he's playing at the moment for Juventus. Uh, but there is talk that Sari's on his way out of Juventus, so potentially under whatever new manager comes in, he'll get another burst of life. Mm-hmm. Um, they lost uh, the Coppa Italia, did they? Yes, yeah, to, to Napoli. First title in um, six years, isn't it, for Napoli? Under Ancelotti. Yeah. But, um, yeah, sadly for Ramsey. He scored a penalty, though, didn't he? But sadly for Ramsey, it's not sort of worked yeah. out for him that well at Juventus. However, I did in the sales the other day buy a Ramsey Juventus shirt. Just because I thought, oh, nice. yeah, I thought it was, it was cheap, it was reduced, and also I thought a bit like John Charles when he played there. You know, I want I want a Ramsey shirt. I love Ramsey. I wouldn't have ever had a Ramsey Arsenal shirt, so I thought I'd get a Ramsey Juventus shirt. But sadly, it was like, I, I think he'd be a good squad player at Liverpool myself. Oh yeah, he definitely. Undoubtedly, I mean, he was talking going back to Arsenal, which would be just so Arsenal if they ended up buying him back when they released him on a free, isn't it? But... I can't imagine he'd go back there. I mean, I, if I was him, I'd, have, I'd be quite cross with Arsenal. Yeah, go, yeah, go to go to Liverpool, win win potentially you know, another Premier League next year or help them win who, another Premier who League. Who did you say would win? I said Juventus, Juventus. But we will see. I mean, yeah, that's going to be a bit of a funny tournament anyway, isn't it? That's going to be a summer tournament in August of a different mm, game every day. That. Knockout, straight knockout. No... Um, no two legs, so it'd be a very, very odd one. That I know, I'm annoyed because Liverpool. If we didn't play that game against Atletico, we'd have we we'd be in it. But oh yeah. well, <laughs> yeah, frustrating. Anyway, it's been a pleasure being back. And um, as lockdown comes to a close, hopefully wherever you are uh, listening, things are starting to get back to normal for you soon. Shops are opening. Uh, we're allowed to go outside and meet people now, and football, perhaps most importantly for the morale, as uh, Dominic Raab said. Football is back for morale sakes. Um, <laughs> doesn't make a face of me there. Um, hey, it is boosting yes. morale. He's not wrong there, is he? He's not wrong. He's not, it has boosted morale. Everyone's been happier since football's back. Thank you, though, for joining me, Ben. Uh, as we said, make sure you check us out on uh, Twitter, at TFHBS, on Facebook, The Football Booster Boys. Check out the website, thefootballboosterboys.com. Get in touch. And also check out our book over on Amazon and other online bookstores. But hopefully... Hopefully when bookstores open, you'll be able to actually see it and pick it up in person. You can go and have a look in your Waterstones uh, and pick up a copy of our book, Football's 50 Most Important Moments. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you very much. See you next time.